Welcome to StreetGangs.com, SGTV. We're at Vraman's Bookstore in Pasadena, California, at Chris Blashford's book signing on his new book called The Black Hand, which is a book about the Mexican Mafia. Through an extensive number of interviews with Boxer Enriquez, he was able to write this book, only the second book ever published about the Mexican Mafia. And we're going to see if we can get an interview with him to find out what it was like, um, his journey, um, publishing this book on the Mexican Mafia. Undercover LAP officers actual videotaped a meeting where more than a thousand gang members showed up. Many of them rivals who, under different circumstances, would have been shooting at each other. But now the Mexican Mafia was calling them all together and told them to stop the drive by shootings against people of their own race, or La Raza. The Mafia wanted all of the gangsters working just for them, a well armed army of 60,000 people. In the very beginning, um, how open was he to talking to you about this project of yours? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, Renee and I had been corresponding to each other for a decade, usually just a letter at Christmas time, and uh, it all stemmed from when I did a story about him, I think it was like 95, which I would mentioned him probably three or four times in other stories that I did, and I got a call one day from his mother, who was furious with me that I was making her son look like this horrible gangster all the time. She said if you would write him a letter, you would find that he really uh, is into talking to youth about not getting into the gangs and you know picking another way of life. So I wrote him this long two-page letter, and thinking you know, the last thing I really needed was some you know mafia soldier's mother to be mad at me. And he wrote me back a long like three-page letter, you know, handwritten. And basically the gist of it was, you know, I, I don't love the way you're portraying me, but I know it's just, you know, your job and I have no animosity towards you, but keep the lines of communication open. So we did. I always sent him a Christmas card or a letter and he always sent me one back. And a couple of times I sent him pictures because he was not allowed in solitary confinement to have pictures of himself and his family. A lot of his family hadn't seen him in years. So I sent him some pictures that I lifted off a of videotape and sent them to him on one occasion. And uh, then when he dropped out, he just he, he told the, his handlers up at Pelican Bay that he wanted to do a book and that he wanted me to do it because, you know, I'd written about him for years. And, um, you know, then it went off in my head that, you know, this guy, I think, always was sort of reaching out. And as I got to know him over a hundred hours or more, you know, I, I realized that he, he was looking for a way out even early on, I think. He knew he'd made a, a huge mistake, although he did relish, too, in his mob reputation. There's no question of that. But uh, you know, he was an intelligent guy, and I think that he had a lot of regrets about the things he's done. And uh, I think he, he, he wanted something on the record you know, that other people could read to see really where this life leads. And it, it doesn't lead to a good place. Near the front of those killers from the Pepsi generation was a relatively young mafioso named Rene Enriquez, also known as Boxer. When he finally dropped out of the mob several years ago, he told investigators that he had personal knowledge of as many as 70 murders done by the Mafia. He was doing 15 to life himself for tip killing two people on the streets of Los Angeles and nearly stabbing to death two others right inside the L.A. County Jail in broad daylight in front of crews of sheriff's deputies. What initially prompted his fallout with the Mexican Mafia in the first place? Well, it, you know, I think it, it, it's a hard question to answer in like 20 or 30 seconds, but I think that his support base, I think with the, uh, when the RICO trials, some of his mentors went away to federal prison for life and uh, they were taken off the street and, you know, other friends that he knew in the Mafia were either, you know, getting killed or going to prison for life in prisons outside of California. He really felt that his power base was weakening. Um, one of his old friends who he had been in business with at Pelican Bay uh, was trying to kill him and he was trying to kill him and uh, it just, you know, as I said in the talk today, I think he, there were a lot of things that just made him what he called mob weary, you know, and I think it's almost somebody asked the question today about post-traumatic stress syndrome and I think 
I think gangsters do go through that. I mean, they, they live a life where they're looking over their shoulder all the time. Um, you know, they see a lot of blood and a lot of stress, and they do get mob weary. And you'd be surprised the number of letters that I get from prison from guys locked down for the rest of their life that are in their 40s and realize that they made a terrible, terrible mistake that the way they lived. And that's what this book is really about, you know, more than anything else. It's not about bashing the mafia as much as it is to, as, as a plea to other people, young kids, don't get involved in this way of life. You know, it may seem cool. You may be getting laid and have a lot of bucks in your pocket from selling dope. But, you know, when you're 40 and you're sitting in Pelican Bay and you got nothing else but blank walls to look at till the day you die, you know, it's not a good choice. I had done a number of stories about Lene Boxer and Rikas. I described him in those stories as a brutal, heroin crazed mafia hitman on more than one occasion. And through a series of events that you will read about in The Black Hand, you will see how the two of us began to correspond with one another, correspondence that was minimal, but lasted for a whole decade. A lot of people understand that most Hispanic gangs are somehow aligned with the Mexican Mafia, but Boxer was not just any ordinary Mexican Mafia guy. He was a high-ranking person. Can you speak a little bit about his position? Well, I think, you know, like he said, you know, like you really earn your way up in the Mafia through the amount of blood that you shed. And he showed that in prison and out in the streets that really he was a cold, cold-blooded killer. And that brought him up into the, what they call the upper echelon of the Mafia. I mean, he was, you know, in constant communication with the guys that we would call the, the heavy hitters, and he was one of the heavy hitters. It's interesting, you know, the first interview I ever did, you know, m much more than a decade ago, with a couple of, uh, with a Mafia associate and a Mexican Mafia member, they agreed to talk to me about anything I wanted to talk about, except one thing. They would not talk about Boxer Enriquez. They were that afraid of him that he was that feared, even among the Mafia, that two guys who were both killers in their own right wouldn't speak about him. Now, a lot of people were wondering if you had threats, and I guess to a lot of people's surprise, that hasn't really been a significant issue with what happened with writing this book. No, it really hasn't. You know, I mean, the only calls I've had were from two former Mafia guys, and uh, they both liked the book. I mean, they thought it was very truthful, and they thought it was very powerful. Um, I, those were both guys that are mafia dropouts who have, you know, had testified in cases, and uh, they're both out on the street now after serving time. And uh, you know, they, they they had no complaints about it. I mean, they thought it was the truth. And I really haven't had any overt threats from from anybody on this. I mean, I've had other threats in the past from other criminal organizations. I've done stories about, but uh, in connection with this book, I really haven't had any. And I hope I don't get any. And I say, you know, if I, I say in the prologue of the book, I address Mexican mafia members, and I say to them, you know, you know, this isn't about bashing the mafia or anything, but it's like, you know, I I, I ask them, do they want their sons involved in this? I think people can lead a better life than this, and I think most of the mafia. Mafia guys, the honest ones who are locked down in Pelican Bay or Florence, Colorado for the rest of their life, don't want their sons in this. I think everybody rec will recognize how powerful the Mexican Mafia is, and they've been around for 40 years, but there's only been two published books on this. And I, to my surprise, why isn't there more work and more research into this organization when you see dozens of books on other types of criminal organizations? Well, I mean, I, I, I think people have been afraid to write about it, frankly. and. Uh, I think now that a few have been written, I think you're going to see more. I think uh, my editor told me that he thought if this book did well, it would probably open the floodgates to a lot of stories, not just about the Mexican mafia, but about you know modern-day gangsters that, that, that are prevalent all across the United States. How often is it that a Mexican mafia at this high status, whether it's 150 of them out there, actually end up debriefing and turning states' evidence? Well, I think more debrief than turn states' evidence. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you need ongoing trials to be a witness. Uh, you know, they've had three big trials here in the 90s. Even Rene, when he, you know, finally dropped out, I don't think there was initial interest because they already locked down a bunch of guys, you know, so the timing has to be right. And I think a lot of these guys, you know, even when they drop out of the mafia, they don't want to testify. Um, they'll debrief and tell what they know, but, you know, they've got this code that you're not to be a rat, and it's hard for them after, you know, 30 years of living that way to all of a sudden 
testify against somebody and, and be a rat. That's like to them, in, in where they grew up, that's the worst thing you can be. You know. Has Boxer ever testified in a case? He has testified in one criminal case, and he's going to testify in another one. And those are the only two. Well, congratulations on this book, and what's the next project for you on the horizon? Uh, I think we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Right, thank you, Alex.